obviously 30 minutes is, is too short to explain uh, what we're doing at Mobileye. But just you know, a, a word following uh, the very interesting talks I've heard by Ian Marin and Peter here. Uh, Mobileye is about, I would say, the tales of distributions. It means the difference between something that kind of works and something that works is, is really the tales of the distribution, the corner cases. And, and it's deep. It's not just having more, having more data. You, know, you think differently about distributions. You think differently about what kind of algorithms. Uh, it, it, it's a complete. It's huge. Okay. So everything here is about. In order to, to, to understand this, let's put aside autonomous driving. Let's take autonomous emergency braking, something that is quite standard today in new cars. So the car would apply the brakes to avoid an accident at certain certain speeds. Now imagine you are driving such a car and all of a sudden the car brakes because there was a false positive. Right? There was no reason to brake, there was no danger, there was no pedestrian, nothing. Maybe there was a shadow in the road or who knows what and the car brake. Now, so you'll be scared to your bones. It's, it's, imagine this experience. You take the car, return it back to the de dealership and you, you would not want to do anything with that company factor. So we're really talking about things that have to be zero false positive, or maybe one false positive in the life of the car, 100,000 kilometers, but it should also work. It means the probability of false negative should be very, very small. Otherwise, you have basically a brick doing nothing. Right? And when you go to autonomous driving, it's even worse, right? because now there's no driver that is responsible. Uh, yeah. OK. So, um, so what, what, what our focus here is, is on two fundamental issues that we're dealing with when we're talking about autonomous uh, driving. And uh, there, there is a clip here that, that, I'll, that I'll, I'll, I'll not show you. This was a year and a half ago, back at the CS 2017. We, we built together a car uh, together with Delphi, which drove for about 10 kilometers in the city of Las Vegas, completely autonomous. It did about 400 runs, uh, 100 runs a day, day and night, reporters, media, everyone you know, came out very, very excited, the best experience that they have seen and so forth. And then I tell myself, well, you know, all of this is one big science experiment. How do we go from what we see here to something that can be uh, really manufactured in millions of, of units with all sorts of uh, guarantees and is, is scalable. So this was kind of the, the question is how do we go from a science project to, to a massive production and, and that really created you know, fundamental thinking about where we are today and, and where we need and where we need to go if we want safety 
what safety means. And you, you have to give guarantees. What kind of guarantee can you give? Can you give a guarantee that you'll never be involved in an accident? That's obviously not correct. Uh, so what can you say about, about safety? Because if these vehicles get involved in fatal accidents, like you know, the Uber incident that was uh, a week or two ago, uh, it, it could kill the entire it could kill the entire industry. Right? So, so what do you say about safety? Because you don't want to spend billions of dollars of, and this is really billions of dollars, billions of dollars of developing this kind of technology, and then it will all go away because of a, a number of accidents, because of misexpectation between the technology providers and society. What does it mean to have an autonomous uh, car in terms of uh, safety? And this is something that, that really nobody talks about. You know, everybody talks about you know, disengagement rate, uh, driving millions of miles and measuring the disengagement. Disengagement rate is, is the, the rate at which the, the safety driver needs to take back a, a control. And, and all of this is, is really, excuse me, is, is really idiotic. So, so these are our two really big, big, uh, big issues. So I'll try to focus on them for the time that I have. So again, just, just you know, Ingmar showed a, a cube with, with the, 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 the critical point that you need in order to develop autonomous car, and I'm reducing this to, to only three. One is all about perception, about sensing, and this includes also fusion, but it's not only cameras, it's radars and, and others. Everything about interpreting the visual world around us to accuracy that is sufficient for control. Second is about, uh, about mapping. How do you create high definition maps? Uh, maps which the details are, are specified to an accuracy of about 10 centimeters and even better. And how do you localize yourself into this, into this map? And how do you build this map to scale? So you can build, you know, map all of the US, map all of uh, Europe. And how do you do it from a logistical point of view how do you do it in a way that it's very cost-effective and is updated all the time, right? This, this is a big, a big issue. This issue is more on the scalability part of, of, of the equation. And then the third one is, is driving a policy where on one hand you want to guarantee safety, but on the other hand you want to be nimble as, 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 a, human, as a human driver. You want to be able to drive in, in challenging places where people negotiate and are aggressive and assertive. Let's call it assertive rather than aggressive. People, there are many places in the world that if you're not an assertive driver, you better stay at home. So, so how do you, on one hand, you know, do a, a learning module that is assertive, on the other hand, guarantee safety? That, that's also a very big, big issue. So, so those are our three, our three pillars. So we, we talk about sensing. I would say that sensing is definitely not commoditized today, <laughs> like what Ingmar said. Again, if you want something that kind of works, yes, it's commoditized. You want that something uh, that, uh, that really works, that, that's it's far away from uh, commoditization. But what I'll show you here in, in this clip is it's some of the outputs. If, if we put all of the outputs, then it will be flatter. What you see here, you see uh, 3D boxes around the vehicles, the, the red lines are uh, road edges, so I'm not displaying here lane marks, just the road edges, the physical barriers, so it could be a curb, a, a road edge. Uh, later you see these yellow rectangles, uh, these are stationary, stationary uh, objects, of course uh, pedestrians uh, you see there, and then there's traffic lights and traffic signs, and then all of that. So let's call that uh, sensing. And, and when you want to talk about sensing, and you have more than one sensor modality, then how do you go about it? And here there is a, one, the conventional wisdom is to do fusion. Start, take all your sensing modalities, pick one sensor as your primary sensor, would be the favorite one is this ladder, and then use other sensors to, to uh, fill the gap and the weaknesses of, of that primary sensor. So, Everything is fused together, so it's basically one sensing system. If it's one sensing system, you don't have redundancy. Uh, you don't have redundancy, it's not only that robustness is becoming weaker, it's the data uh, validation that is becoming uh, tricky. So when you're talking about tails of uh, distribution, you're thinking about a very, very low probability of something bad happening. Like a sensing mistake that would lead to an accident. Now this, this is very, very rare. So, so we know from computer science that if we have an event 
and a very small probability p, the amount of data that we will need to collect is inversely proportional, so it's 1 over p. So if we're talking about a probability per one hour of driving, then 1 over p would be the amount of hours that we'll need to, uh, to validate. And, and the kind of probabilities that, that really make sense is about 10 to the minus 9. It means 10 to the minus 9 probability of fatality per one hour of driving is something that makes uh, sense. With humans, it's 10 to the minus 6. So, you, know. so, so you need to be 1,000 times better uh, than, than, than humans. Um, so it means that we'll need to collect 10 to the power of 9 hours of driving, and that's about 30 billion kilometers, so that's completely out of scope. But if you have redundancy, then you can start, it will be one over, say if you have two separate systems that are each one capable to do the function from end to end, then you'll have one over square root of, of the probability. So now you have 10 to the power of 4, 10 to the power of 5, and that, is, that, that, that is, is quite reasonable. So when we talk about sensing, we are really trying to build a computer vision system that is end-to-end -end capable of doing autonomous driving. I'll show you later some, some clips. End-to-end -end meaning from sensing, driving policy, mapping, localization into the map, all through using cameras, and, and we humans are a proof of concept that it can be done. And then a separate system with radars and radars that are doing things independently, and then you start getting to, to, to redundancy. Um, so that, that, that's uh, sensing. About, uh, about mapping, the big logistical problem with, with, with maps is not only how you build the maps, but how you update the map. And I think that question was, was, was uh, people received that question as well, how do you update these uh, maps? So what, what we're doing here is we are relying on the fact that almost every new car has a front-facing camera and a very sophisticated silicon chip uh, processing the data coming from that camera, so we can use all the sensing perception of that front camera, the stuff that I've shown you in the previous uh, clip, to find information of interest, which, be, which would be the information from the scene, the, the, the lane marks, but also landmarks, poles, traffic signs, traffic lights, anything that you can use in order to localize uh, yourself. Send that to the cloud, it's about 10 kilobytes per, per kilometer, so it's very, very small. And then in the cloud, try to build the maps automatically. Today, these maps are not built automatically. It's very, very lots and lots of manual, manual labor to build high-definition maps. So, what kind of information you need to collect from the scene and how do you go and build these maps uh, automatically is very, very critical. If you are able to do that, then you have a true crowdsourcing because there are millions of cars produced every year with front-facing camera. Just to give an idea, it's all public information. Last year, Mobileye ship shipped about 9 million system on chips, so 9 million cars with this kind of technology. Right? So, so, so then you have true crowd, uh, true crowdsourcing. So just, just to show you an idea how this looks like, in this clip on the left-hand side, the, the, the lines that you see are map data projected on, onto the image space. So it's not lanes that are being detected, it's map data projected onto the image space and the yellow rectangles are, are landmarks. And the right-hand side is the same thing, but projected on, onto Google Earth. And what you can appreciate is the accuracy of these lines. You see they sit exactly on, on, on the landmarks. So these are accuracies about five centimeter uh, accuracy. So these maps are being built uh, automatically through crowdsourcing and then used for autonomous uh, driving. This is uh, Japan being uh, mapped completely using this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, technology. So th this is about maps. About the uh, driving policy, Andrew, can you give me seven minutes? Uh, yeah. There's a few clips that I think yeah. would be yeah. fun to show, and I don't want to run my time before showing them. So when you talk about driving policy, I mentioned one hand you want safety, on the other hand you want nimbleness. The kind of nimbleness that, that, that you want, this is on my way to work. So if you look at that, kind of negotiations that, that people do are very tough. This guy here will never be able to, to merge. No one will let him merge. And we're going, at some point we're going to fast forward this, uh, this clip and the poor guy will not be able to merge. And this, uh, yeah, this one, this long truck, 
will take many, many minutes uh, to emerge. So, so these are the kind of negotiations, the nimbleness that, that we want to that we want to handle. Uh, the same thing here. At least this is what's called a double merge, uh, where two humans don't succeed in doing it. <laughs> So, if, if, we, if we want autonomous vehicles to, to go everywhere, these, these these are the kinds of challenges that one needs to one needs to handle. Um, so, in terms of uh, safety, uh, what uh, what we did, we published half a year ago uh, an academic paper, and the reason that we published that many things we do at Mobile we don't publish. You know, it's IP, you don't you don't, don't publish. But this thing we, we did publish because. Safety is something that should be standardized. Something that lifts all, all, all boats, kind of raises all boats. Um, and and what, we, what, what we noticed that safety is not something that is in the normal conversation. So, so we published a, a, a paper about that. And the first thing that, that we, we mentioned that absolute safety is impossible because sometimes I'm not a plane. Somebody can hit me and there's no way for me to, to escape that accident. Like this blue car in, in the center. Therefore, if absolute safety is not possible, what, what do we really mean by, by, by safety? And then what, what we said, we can, we can guarantee that we will not cause an accident. We can't guarantee that we will not be involved in an accident, but we can guarantee we will not cause an accident. So we cannot separate sensing from driving policy. Let's assume that my sensing is correct. I interpreted the environment correctly, and now I'm making decisions. How do I make sure that when I make decisions, I can guarantee that I'll never be involved, I'll never cause, never cause an accident? And this question is, is, is not trivial because if, if you look at today's, at the situation of today, kind of uh, the common sense of driving, if I go and cut someone and that someone hits me, now we'll go to court, I'll claim that he was not attentive, he'll claim that I was reckless. Right? And it's the matter of the judge, jury, lawyers, the salary level that they get, and so forth. And, to, and this is not something that, that we want to have autonomous cars be, be subjected to, because there are many, many accidents. If each accident like, would, would generate so, so much uh, media attention, we, we would like to set the rules of the game in advance. So it means to, to define what it means to be dangerous, to define what it means to have a proper response, and, and so forth. Um, I'll, I'll skip. This. So we, we set up a model that is a responsibility sensitive safety. It means we want to eventually assign responsibility and make sure that you would never be responsible for causing an accident. And, and we, we, we found out that you need to answer three questions. Actually, two and the third follows quite naturally. One, what does it mean to be involved? What, what, what does it mean to be in a dangerous uh, situation? The kind of example that I gave with the cut in. What, did I enter into a dangerous situation? Yes or not? So we don't want now the, the court to, to start making those decisions. Uh, what is the proper response to get out of a dangerous situation? Even if I am never going to get into a dangerous situation, this author can put me in a dangerous situation. How do, I, how do I respond out of a dangerous situation? And then once you answer these two questions, you can answer about responsibility. The, the party, the agent that did not have the proper response is the one that uh, and. Uh, and we, we, we reduce this to really four principles, because driving seems like a, a complex, but we, we reduce it to, to four principles. And actually there, there, was <clears throat> there was a very, very interesting insight that I, uh, I never said in public. We, we, we say on one hand, negotiation, it, driving is complicated. You know, we take driving lessons and so forth. But on the other hand, <clears throat> even the dumbest people can drive. So it can't be too complicated, right? <laughs> so uh, it's, it's a, so we can reduce it to, to, to four uh, principles. One is the rule number one, if you are hit from behind, it's not your fault. But uh, rule number two, if the front car performed a maneuver, uh, then uh, a reckless cut in, then it is my fault, even if I was hit from, from, from behind. Rule number three, it's about the common sense of driving, that the right of way is given, not taken. And rule number four, what do we do with occlusions, with limited uh, visibility? How do we handle the limited visibility? And then we set out two criteria. One is soundness. We would like to create a model in which if the model 
says that the agent doesn't is not is not a blame for the accident. Human judgment will comply with it. Human judgment will will confirm that this agent is doesn't have the blame. And the second one is, is usefulness to create a model in which assertive driving is still possible under that uh, under that model, and that you can validate it in, in a uh, computationally reasonable manner without a computational explosion of checking all possible you know, all possibilities, no butterfly effect, and, and so forth. So I, I'll not go into details. You can go and read the paper. It, it's, it's online. I'll just few uh, a few examples, and, and then I'll. I'll so this is from a, a simu simulator example. This is this uh, double merge uh, maneuvers. All the red cars, they want to uh, merge right, and the white cars merge left. And at each time, uh, eight cars are placed randomly on a stretch of about 100 meters. And they need to do the maneuver on one hand without creating any accident, and second, without slowing traffic uh, too much, right? Because if you stop, you can do everything. And uh, so th th this, is, this is considered a very complicated uh, maneuver in dense, in, in dense traffic. But now, let, let me show you three examples of actual uh, autonomous uh, vehicle uh, driving, which fold all these uh, principles. So the autonomous car that I'm showing you here is only cameras. And again, it's not that we think that a camera-only system can go into production. It is because of this true redundancy that we want to create. Right? Then we put ladders and ladders as another layer of redundancy. So it's only, it's, it's only cameras. Second, the driving policy and the safety, this RSS, are being merged together. Because you can think of the RSS as a filter model. You have a driving policy that generates trajectories, and then you have the safety model that vets out dangerous trajectories. This is possible. But it's, it's, uh, it's problematic in the sense that we really want to reduce the, the tails of the distribution, those very, very rare events that will require us to collect a lot of data. RSS does not allow you to enter into a dangerous situation. So if this is, it is embedded into the learning module that learns to generate trajectories, then it will never generate it, from, to begin with, it will never generate a trajectory that is dangerous. And therefore, we are cutting out the tails of the distributions even from the learning point. And then we can validate this with a you know, much lower, much smaller number of, of uh, amounts of, of data. What I want to show you here is examples of assertiveness of, of driving. So, what we are gradually doing, we are mapping Jerusalem. So, so, driving in Israel is challenging. Driving in Jerusalem is not for the faint of heart. Uh, and you really need to be, you really need to be assertive. And the car is driving autonomously in, in, in the streets of, of uh, Jerusalem while we're testing uh, the concept. So in this case, what, what we see here, uh, this, is, this is our agent. These are the other uh, road users. These are the other uh, road users. And These are the other road users, and the car would merge behind this vehicle. Now, it's very dense. Now, what you can notice that what happened here is that in order to merge, the car sped up, increased, increased speed in order to merge here. Right? Because if it was trying to align itself with the flow, the gap would be too small, not be able to enter, because it knows that the other car is going to, is going to fill the gap. So you need to accelerate in order to, in order to, and this is something that's very natural for a human, uh, for a human to do. Once you decided what you want to do, you want to do it assertively. So one, one of the ways to do it assertively is not accelerating. Another, another example here is that the car, in the very dense traffic, wants to start exiting. So wants to turn, wants to go to the right lane. And, and there's, no, there's no gap to, uh, to enter. So what the system has, has done when, when it merged, it created the car from behind to slow down. Now this is something that we do, that we do, all, that we do all, all, all the time, right? 
we do a calculation of what is the gap such that the car behind us would slow down but not involve in an emergency braking. So if the car behind us starts applying emergency braking, that's a reckless cut in. But if you are allowed to slow down, that's not a reckless cut in. This is what humans do. And this is part of this RSS model. Now, there are parameters of what kind of slowing down you're allowing the car behind you to do. And in that way, you can go in circuitly. Let me show you another. This is, this is really dense, what you see, you see from, from, from here. And the car needs to exit someplace uh, later, and it will enter in a very dense uh, situation, um, again, in a very, in a very, assertive, <coughs> in a very assertive manner. So these are the kinds of, of uh, challenges. On one hand, to be assertive. On the other hand, to have a model that you know that you're not going to cause, cause an accident. So just final words about this, uh, about this uh, model. It's not just about uh, formalizing uh, the law because you're allowed to do traffic violations if you want to escape an accident. What you're not allowed to do is create another accident. And the idea here is to model you know, the common sense of driving, you know, the human knowledge of common sense of uh, driving. And uh, again, we're talking about guarantees and not about probabilities. So we said that safety cannot be something which is about data-driven and probabilities, it has to come from guarantees. And then comfort is something that you can do as a data-driven. If you have a comfort system or not comfort system, it could be based on the data. data and then we're, we're working now with regulatory bodies in order to standardize or use this as a starting point for standardization. So if, I, if I'm summarizing, I would say that, you know, when you talk about sensing, validation of sensing can be done offline. You know, it's not a reactive system. You can have systems that collect data and then in the lab do your uh, validation. Unlike driving policy, which is a, it's reactive, but it's, it's a closed loop. And then there's this issue of uh, true redundancy. When do you start doing your fusion? We claim that for data validation and robustness, you have to have really separate systems and not just everything is fused together into one, into one system. It hurts with uh, robustness and data validation. Another one is the scalability about high definition maps. The whole idea of high definition, high definition maps, how you build them, how you update them, how do you do it at cost, is, is a very, very big issue that prevents the uh, scalability. And the third is the planning, the driving uh, policy. I, I didn't discuss how we, how we do it, um, but you know, the classical robotics way of doing it where it ex explodes exponentially with the time horizon and, and the number of uh, vehicles unless you start you know, employing all sorts of uh, heuristics. Um, you know, there are all sorts of myths about reinforcement learning. You know, if, if you read very, very carefully you know, papers by DeepMind on, you know, on their successes, you would say that you, you, you'll notice how deep learn, how reinforcement learning is really not used. Read, read it carefully. Right? There's lots of myths about reinforcement learning, when they work, when they do not work, about deep reinforcement learning. How to do it uh, in a way that really works requires a lot, a lot of uh, care. And this is one big area that, uh, that can impede on scalability. You know, this, uh, the driving uh, policy. And we look at the safety. The idea is to separate comfort from safety. Comfort can be data-driven, can be learned, but safety has to be model-based. And in that way, you can also validate the system. Sensing requires data-driven validation, but that's offline. Comfort requires data-driven validation, but that's not safety. You can have a non-comfort system and still it's okay. And safety is model-based. You don't need to drive a single mile. So you can start creating a validation system that is not related to this disengagement, this engagement rate of just collecting miles and miles and miles and miles. As I mentioned before, if you want to reach the probabilities that make sense, which is 10 to the minus of nine, 10 to the power of minus nine, probability of fatality per one hour, hour of driving, no matter how many miles you, you report, it's not going to be uh, sufficient. So you need to break this down in a bit more clever, clever manner. Okay, so this is. Thank you. Thank you.